If Cynthia traveled the Galar region, could she defeat Leon and become the strongest champion in all of Pokemon? To find out, I'll be playing Pokemon Shield as Cynthia. This means using only Cynthia's Pokemon and their pre-evolutions. But to make things harder, I can only use the moves that Cynthia used across the games and anime. My goals were simple. Catch every one of Cynthia's Pokemon and see if they could conquer all of Pokemon Shield. With a ton of extra rules on top to make this challenge even harder, could Cynthia prove herself as the champion of all champions? Well, let's find out. I load in as Cynthia, naturally dressed in black on black. We also meet Hop, a proud Cynthia for Cynthia. Me too, Hop. Me too. Cynthia has an awesome roster of Pokemon, so let me know which one is your favorite in the comments below. Wow, now that is a smart Wooloo. But once reaching Wedgehurst, we finally meet him, Leon, our true rival in this run. He's clearly not even fit to dress himself, let alone be the champion. Unbeatable champion, eh? We'll see about that. Leon does give us our starter Pokemon, and it's definitely an interesting selection. Let me know in the comments who you're taking. Gibble? Gibble? Or if you're feeling really bold, Gibble. Gibble is usually only obtainable late in the game or via trade. But since this is the Cynthia run, I thought Gibble would be the only fitting starter since Garchomp is Cynthia's day one homie. I could have just traded one over, but then we wouldn't be treated to these animations. Anyway, I picked my Gibble and then we beat up Hop. Now we had our baby shark, but soon after, I found another catchable Pokemon, Badoo. Pokeball, go! All right, you give me no choice. I'll have to use my secret catching technique. <laughs> you win this round. Berries, I've got your fresh picked berries. Uh, do you have any ice cream? Ew, no, of course not. Gibble, send this man to the Shadow Realm. Leon gives us a catching tutorial, which is insulting. I'm the Sinnoh champion. Of course I know how to catch a Pokemon, most of the time. Now we have to battle Hop to determine whether we're worthy to take on the gym challenge. But I mean, this is Hop we're talking about. So this should be a piece of cat. Oh. Look, it was a three on one. Cut me some slack. Luckily, out of pity, the game still lets us progress. While our team is kind of weak, that's about to change because now we have access to the wild area. Here we can add some extra Pokemon to the team, starting in the rolling fields where I find a Badu that we actually catch this time. Our last encounter for now is this raid den where I found the unscrambled egg Togepi. After our raid squad cracked and fried it, we caught Togepi, adding it to our roster. From this point on in the run, I can only use the moves that Cynthia's Pokemon have used in either the games or anime. So, to get some moves on my Pokemon, I farmed Raid Dens, which drops TRs as loot. We didn't have many options so far, but the team was starting to come together. Next, we reach the town of Motorstoke, and here, I print a trainer card that is sure to strike fear into the hearts of our enemies. Finally, a place that sells sweets. One ice cream, please. Perfect. Well, well, well. If it isn't the second best champion in Galar, Charizard, teach her a lesson. My ice cream! You monster! You'll pay for this! F's in the chat for Cynthia's ice cream. When signing up for the gym challenge, I pick 506 as my uniform number, since this is the episode where Cynthia made her debut and literally soloed Paul's entire team with just her Garchomp. What a chad. Ew, I hate this uniform. Needs way more black. Just as we leave Motorstoke, Hop stops us for a rematch. Our last battle did not go well, but this time it's a fair three on three fight. I lead with our walking egg and use the only move I have, Dazzling Gleam. Two of these crush Hop's Wooloo before he sends out Score Bunny. We trade blows back and forth, but since Togepi's about to go down, I switch into our Gibble, who has a much stronger matchup. Gibble only has one usable move in Dragon Claw, but a few of these finish the job on Score Bunny, and Gibble hangs on just long enough to bury Hop's Rookadi, giving us the win and some sweet revenge onto Hop. Being the good Simpia that he is, Hop opens up his wallet. We then move through Route 3 and into the Galar Mine. However, before we reach the exit, we're stopped by Bede for a battle. But there's no way the Sinnoh champ could possibly lose to a little girl in a bright pink coat, right? I lead with Gibble, who's able to take Solosis down with two Dragon Claws, but took a huge chunk of damage in the process. Bede follows up with Hatana, who's faster than my Gibble, quickly picking up the trade and making it a two versus two. I then send out my egg in this trying time, with Hatana and Togepi trading blows back and forth. But since Hatton is faster, it was also able to finish Togepi off. Double kill. 
I was down to only my Badu, who finished Hatana with an energy ball. It was down to the wire. My Badu against Bead's Gothita. I fired off an energy ball and hit the insane luck of triggering a special defense drop, which should let me finish it off on the next turn. Wait, what? Turns out that my insane luck was actually insanely unlucky because that stat drop triggered Gothita's competitive ability, sharply raising its stats. Due to this boost, Badu then fell to a single Psybeam. Yet another loss already. This challenge was starting out way harder than I expected. Maybe Leon really is the strongest champion. But I wasn't going to give up yet. I trained my team a little before returning for a rematch with Bead. This time, after I took out Solosis, I switched into Togepi. Thanks to a lucky crit, Togepi was just able to outlast Hatana this time around. Gothita almost clutched up for Bead, taking out both my Togepi and Gibble. However, in the process, Gothita was weakened just enough for Badu to finish things off with an energy ball, giving us the win this time around, even if it was still close. This clears us to enter Route 4, where, after a long hunt, we find our next encounter, Eevee. It'll eventually evolve into Cynthia's Glaceon, but we need an Ice Stone for that, and we can't get our hands on one of those for quite a while. Meaning, our little Eevee will stay as an Eevee for now. Problem is, Glaceon's move pool is already slim, but the only valid move that it can learn as an Eevee is Shadow Ball, so Eevee won't be having too much of an impact for now. Now we've made it to Turfield for our debut gym battle. The puzzle has us round up some Wooloo, but that's not too difficult when I have a baby shark in my pocket. However, before we take on the gym leader, we have a tough decision to make. Under the rules of this challenge, I can only bring a team size equal to the gym leader. Since Milo only has two Pokemon, I'll have to pick just two of my Pokemon to battle with. And after giving it some thought, I decided to bring Badu and our ace, Gibble. With that taken care of, we stepped up to face Milo. Badu may look cute and innocent, but to a grass trainer like Milo, Badu is the devil. Because not only does Badu have a four times resistance to grass attacks, but it can also hit grass types with super effective poison moves. So very quickly, we take Gossiflua down with two sludge bombs. But Milo's next Pokemon is much tougher. Dynamax Eldegoss. Badu is able to wear it down with a few more sludge bombs, however, goes down to a max strike. Now it was down to a 1v1, but we've still got our ace, Gibble. The Dynamax is now over, but we still take huge damage from Leafage. Thankfully, Gibble just survives a second attack before landing another Dragon Claw, taking out Eldegoss and giving us a close win. That secures Cynthia's first Galar badge, one step closer to Leon. Next, we move on to Route 5, where my cute fairy egg absolutely terrorizes Team Yell with a string of super effective Dazzling Gleams. But just ahead, we run into Cynthia's favorite Tier 3 sub, Hop. We've got a one-to-one -one record, so Cynthia needed to establish her dominance. Hop leads with his Wooloo and tries to kick my plant. Pathetic. A second Sludge Bomb on the next turn crushes Wooloo, giving us the early lead. Hop's newly evolved Corvusquire is next, and while I do hit it for decent damage, a super effective pluck puts Badu on the brink of death. I switch into Gibble as Hop just uses Leer twice, buying me enough time to crush Corvusquire with a Dragon Claw. Hop was down to only his Raboot, but it went absolutely wild. I was able to get it low with Dragon Claw, but Hop broke the rules and healed up with an item. His Raboot then destroyed my Eevee and Badu. With both of my remaining Pokemon low, Hop was about to sweep through the rest of my team when... Oh my god, what a throw! Are you really Leon's brother? That gave us the win over Hop solely due to luck. Anyway, now we reach the town of Holbury where this girl has an important question. It's hard to tell if a whooper is female or male. Can you do it? Of course, I'll just use my hand and... Well, she should have been more specific. It's not my fault. The second gym is also here, so after navigating my way through the watery maze, it was time to tackle the leader. Now, Nessa uses three Pokemon, so we just have to pick one of our four Pokemon to bench. This decision is pretty easy, since Eevee is the obvious choice. So with my plant, egg, and baby shark in tow, we stepped up to face Nessa. I lead with Togepi, and the start of this fight goes well, with a few dazzling gleams flushing Goldeen. Aracuda does finish Togepi off, as well as deal huge damage onto Gibble with a crit Aqua Jet. However, one Dragon Claw from our ace is enough to finish the job. Nessa was down to only her last Pokemon, but it is a tough one. 
Dreadnought has solid stats for this early in the game, and it's Dynamaxed. We had a 2 on 1 advantage, but it wasn't enough, as Dreadnought proceeded to quickly sweep through the rest of my team. Yet another loss. I was back to the drawing board in need of a new plan. However, then I realized that both my Togepi and Badu evolved via friendship. So I headed to the wild area and slapped this stick around until they loved me. This allowed my Togepi to evolve into Togetic, followed by Badu, who evolved into Roselia. This gives my team a huge power boost, so before long, I was back at Nessa for a rematch. Togetic or Toga Thick? How does it even stay airborne with a booty that big? Just like our first battle, Togepi is able to take Goldeen out, but this time can also take Aracuda down. This leaves us in a 3 on 1, but Dreadnought is still a massive threat. Nessa immediately finishes off Togetic, so I follow up with Gibble, who absolutely clutches up, surviving on just 1 HP. This is vital, because while Gibble does fall on the following turn, this means that the Dynamax has now expired. This turns the odds in my favor, as Roselia can survive a Razor Shell before firing off a huge 4 times effective Energy Ball to finally pick up the KO on Dreadnought. It wasn't easy, but that gives us our second badge. To celebrate, Rose treats us to a meal, and yep, I think I found Nirvana. Our next stop is Gala Mine 2, Electric Boogaloo. Beads here, and I've got a score to settle with her after our last encounter. My usually useless Eevee is actually kinda helpful here. A Shadow Ball hits Beads Psychic types for super effective damage. This lets me take out Solosis and do some big damage to Gothita. Eevee does fall, but from here, Togetic does a lot of the heavy lifting, giving us a much easier win this time around. You're not weak, you just lack talent. Excuse me? Do you know who I am? I will end you. Right after the battle, I spotted a Shellos. I had to make sure that it was male, for reasons which I'll get into later. Before long, I was able to catch our new slug, Shellos. Hang on, that doesn't look like Cynthia's. So it turns out you can't actually catch the pink Shellos in Gala, but that's nothing that a little coat of paint can't fix. Ah, much better. Our pink slug has access to some powerful moves, and picking up a water type Pokemon is huge considering who the next gym leader is. After teaching Team Yell all about the joys of fairy type Pokemon, our Gibble evolved into its awkward teenage form, Gabite. It really does just look like a little Garchomp. Oh god, not again! Get me away from these owls! After circling back to Motostoke, we head for the Badu Inn where Marnie is waiting. At the very least, I'm sure Cynthia would respect Marnie's fashion sense. I was planning to unleash my new Gabite here. Leading with my upgraded Ace, I was able to remove Marnie's Krogunk with two Dragon Claws and weaken the Scraggy that followed before finally going down. From here, Roselia can finish Scraggy off before our new Shellos takes care of more Peko. You might dress like Cynthia, but you are not as strong as Cynthia. Someone who is strong is the next gym leader, Kabu. His team is stacked with three powerful, fully evolved fire types. Picking a strong team here is vital. Now, I'm obviously not bringing my plant to a firefight, and Eevee is still pretty useless. So that leaves us with these three. After upgrading my movesets a little, it was time to take on Kabu. He leads with a Ninetales that loves to burn you with Will-O-Wisp, so I lead with my Shellos since it's a special attacker. And as expected, I got burned immediately. Ninetales then traps Shellos with Fire Spin, but a second Scald from our Pink Slug takes it down, giving us the early lead. Arcanine is next, and Shellos eats the Intimidate. After some stalling with Recover, I eventually land a Scald for solid damage, but Shellos then fell, although he did his job. Next up is Togetic, who cleans up Arcanine with two Psychics. This leaves Kabu with only one more Pokemon, but it's his Gigantamax Center Scorch, and immediately it incinerates my Togetic. This leaves us with only our Ace, Gabite. But I've got a trick up my sleeve for this, because I taught my Gabite Stone Edge before the battle for this very scenario. It hits Center Scorch for four times effectiveness and does huge damage, but does fall short of getting the KO. I thought that this would be the end as Center Scorch charged up an attack. But Gabite held on and landed another Stone Edge to finish the giant centipede on the next turn. That's our third badge, and this challenge has not been easy so far. With how tough this was, I knew that beating Leon was not going to be easy, but we had plenty of tough fights to go before that. The three gym leaders we've already beaten give us a send-off, while also confessing that they've become Cynthia's for Cynthia. Honestly, I can't blame them. My throws are the greatest. Oh, trust me, Hop. I know that you're great at throwing. We make our way through the wild area and... Ice cream! Come here, please! I promise I won't eat you. Probably. <sighs> 
fine. After a jog through the wild area, we made it to Hammerlock. Here, Chairman Rose gives us an explanation of how energy is generated and, uh, okay, I guess I'll do my part. Did something happen with Hop? Yeah, he found out that Bede's actually a guy and he's heartbroken. Wait, Bede's a guy? Once my team gets to level 30, our Shellos evolves into Gastrodon. Finally, our first fully evolved Pokemon from Cynthia's team. Moving on, next is Route 6, where Togetic dominates Team Yell again, and we also find the Dig TM here, teaching this to Gabite since Garchomp uses it in the anime. This move is going to be very important, and you'll see why a little later. We pay our respects to Lord Diglett before reaching the town of Stoneside. Gotta keep stirring the pot. Uh, Grandma, what pot? Did you remember to take your meds this morning? Pops back for another rematch, and while he was never the smartest trainer, I think he somehow got dumber. Because after seeing my Gabite use Earthquake, this idiot used Dig. Underground is not where you want to be when an Earthquake hits. Anyway, my Gabite tore his team to shreds, giving us a pretty easy win over Galar's next top simp. This clears us to take on the next gym, which specializes in ghost types. But Alistair has a crazy strong Gigantamax Gengar, so I needed to power up my team. One way I could do that is through evolutions, since three of my Pokemon evolve via stones. However, the only way I can get the stones this early is to send prayers to RNGesus and spam the digging duo. I had to spend a ton of watts, but dug up a shiny stone and use it to evolve our Roselia into the beautiful bouquet Roserade. After upgrading our movesets, these were the four Pokemon that I decided to bring to Alistair's House of Horrors. Against his Yun Mask, I go with Roserade and take advantage of its part ground typing with an energy ball decimating it in one shot. Mimikyu is up next and tanks my first attack thanks to its disguise ability. Thankfully though, Roserade can survive two slashes before finishing Mimikyu with two more Shadow Balls. After doing some small damage to Alistair's dead piece of coral, Roserade does finally go down, but it put in some absolute work. Next up is Gabite, who cleans up Kursla with an Earthquake, leaving Alistar with only his Gigantamax Gengar. Fortunately, Gabite does survive an attack before using Dig. Now, you might be wondering why I would use Dig instead of Earthquake when the latter is more powerful. Well, Dig is a two-turn move, meaning I can burn two turns of Dynamax with just one attack. Dig lands for big damage, and while Gabite falls on the turn after, we've succeeded at stalling out the Dynamax. This clears the path for our squishy slug to slide on in and fall asleep. Luckily, it wakes up after one turn, landing an Earth Power to finish the fight and give Cynthia badge number four. Soon after, we run into Bede again. I still haven't forgotten the disrespect that he threw at me last time, so I unleashed a dose of flower power onto Bede with Roserade tearing him to pieces. <laughs> now who lacks talent? The ancient wall falls down and reveals a sacred hidden statue of God. It's so beautiful. We trek through the Glimwood Tangle, which is pretty dark and spooky, but I'm fine since I've got a literal shark who walks on land, which is way scarier than anything here. So pretty quickly, we reach the town of Bolonlia, and it's already time for another gym. She looks kind of strong. Kind of. I'll have you know, I've been mercilessly crushing children's dreams since 2006. The gym puzzle here is an audition for the role of gym leader, but this is pretty insulting. I'm the Sinnoh champion. Why would I be auditioning for a demotion? Needless to say, we pass the audition with flying colors, earning our chance to take on the gym leader. This one's a four on four, so we have to decide who to bench. Ah, oh, well that was an easy choice. We stepped up to face Opal, who doesn't knows what's about to hit her. Her wheezing lead lands big damage onto Togetic with some sludge, but I pick up the KO with a second psychic. Opal then disrespects me by sending out her Togekiss. Who are you? I'm you, but stronger. Oh yeah, we'll see about that. Oh. Now it was a three versus three. I went with Roserade next and we both traded big super effective blows. But since Roserade is way too speedy, we land our second sludge bomb first to get the KO. I expected Roserade to fall here, but Opal decided to use Iron Defense against my special attacker. Wow, that lets Roserade land another energy ball, picking up an unlikely knockout onto Morwile. Now Opal was down to only her giant cake. Roserade lands a big sludge bomb and somehow tanks an attack. But then Opal asks us a trick question. How old am I? You might look at Opal and think the answer here is 88. However, someone as smart as Cynthia can tell just by how awful her decision making was in this fight that she can't possibly be older than 16. Outsmarted, kid. 
This sharply raises my offense, and it's this boost that gives Roserade just enough power to finish Al Kremi with one more sludge bomb. That's our fifth badge, and the team was really starting to come together. We make Opal carry us all the way back to Hammerlock before running into the guy who lacks talent. <laughs> Karma really is a bitch. Anyway, speaking of lacking talent, our favorite simp is here too. Hop may have had our number earlier in the challenge, but now we've established our dominance and taking his team down is light work for Cynthia. He dropped us a fat super thanks comment before heading on to Route 8. This is important because it's here that we find our second shiny stone. With it, our Togetic finally gets to grow up into a dashing Togekiss. We then continued making our way through Route 8. Hurry up, come on! On the other side, we make it to Sir Chester City and I have a feeling that Cynthia would love this place. Sometimes the only thing to do in cold weather is to have an ice cream. I have finally found my people. Hey, uh, can you tell me where the gym is? You're just gonna ignore me? So rude. Eventually I found the gym, but it turns out that this one uses ice types, which, uh, yeah, isn't exactly great for me. So I needed a new plan and decided to go and hunt for another one of Cynthia's Pokemon. Eventually, I found my Riolu. Now I just need to catch it and... Okay, well, let's forget about this one. Eventually, I found Riolu too and was able to catch it this time. Just like Badu and Togepi, this little guy evolves via friendship. So after more furious shaking through the power of friendship, our Riolu evolved into an awesome Lucario. Cynthia's Lucario is an absolute beast. It's a great Pokemon to begin with, but Cynthia's has access to some incredibly powerful moves. So with a new Pokemon secured, it was time to go and challenge the Ice Gym. Wasn't she in the news? Hey, those allegations are still before the court. With my team consisting of three Pokemon weak to ice, I then stepped up to face Melanie. Her lead is a Frostmoth who's four times weak to rock. So I go with Gabite and a single Stone Edge crushes it like the bug that it is. But Darmanitan is next and this is a different story because a single Icicle Crash decimates Gabite. Although here is where I get to show the dominance of Lucario. I immediately set up a nasty plot, boosting my special attack. Darmanitan fires back with a taunt, but this is useless because a single Flash Cannon is enough to crush it on the next turn, as well as the Ice Q that follows. Already, Melanie was down to only her Gigantamax Lapras. It's an incredibly strong Pokemon, but so is Lucario. I tank a Max Geyser, and on the following turn, a second Aura Sphere is all that it takes for Cynthia to claim her sixth badge. That was dominant. To celebrate the win, we grab a meal with Sonya and Hop. Where are the Sword and Shield? Perhaps they went into some kind of sleep. Yeah, they're just sleeping. Six feet underground. Anyway, Hop wants another shot at the champ, and this'll be easy, right? Well, not quite. I was feeling way too confident after dominating Melanie. Lucario did manage to take double out pretty quickly, but Hop returned fire with Cinderace getting the revenge knockout. Gabite took big damage from a mega kick before burying Cinderace with an earthquake. But then Hop sent out his Snorlax and this is where my trouble began. With Lucario down, I didn't have anything to counter it. Togekiss did land a paralysis with Thunder Wave, but fell to heavy slam in the process. An earthquake from Gabite did decent damage. However, it also fell to Snorlax Snorlax's devastating power. Gastrodon managed to get Snorlax low, but Hop just healed right back up on the very next turn. I started stalling with Recover, as this was buying time for the hail damage to slowly chip away at Snorlax. Once it was low enough, only now did I land an Earth Power, with Snorlax finally falling to hail damage at the end of the turn. Although, next is Corvusquire, who I have absolutely nothing for, and it quickly ripped through my Gastrodon and Eevee. While Roserade did eventually take it down, we'd taken way too much damage by now. Ultimately, Roserade fell to hail damage. We lost to Hop. No, I'm not salty at all. <sighs> After actually remembering to plug my brain in, I rematched Hop and things went much smoother this time. Lucario took out Double just like before. However, this time I switched into Gastrodon against Cinderace. They traded blows before both falling to hail damage at the exact same time. Lucario was able to remove Corviknight with a few Aura Spheres before a switch into Gabite led to a quick KO on Pincurchin. Hop Snorlax is still a problem, but my Gabite and Lucario teamed up to take it down, giving us the win this time around. Much better. Wasn't even close. 
Eevee tried to evolve, but don't you dare even think about it until I shove an ice stone down your throat. Onwards to Route 9, and after Togekiss does its daily domination of Team Yell, we get access to the upgraded bike and can now travel across the water. This is crucial because it lets us get some serious upgrades to our team. First, by crossing the Lake of Outrage in the wild area, we can finally get our hands on an ice stone. This lets our Eevee evolve into Glaceon, the Pokemon with neckties for ears. Congratulations, now I can finally remove this. On top of Glaceon, there's another Pokemon I can get, but this one is a pain. Feebas. This stupid fish is a nightmare. The easiest way to get one is by fishing, but it only has a 1% chance to appear. However, this is the Cynthia run and I am dedicated to the cause, so I had no choice. I sat there, fishing rod in hand, for a small eternity as time rolled by. Until, after about one hour, I finally found Feebas. Now just to weaken it, and... Uh, why? It's fine. I love fishing so, so much. Anyway, after those <coughs> complications, I got back to fishing. And after another 45 minutes, I finally reeled in another Feebas. I didn't attack it because who would be dumb enough to do that? I caught it with a single Pokeball, adding Feebas to our roster. <sighs> a face only a mother could love. Right next to our fishing spot, I picked up the Prism Scale. By trading Feebas while holding this, it turns into a glamorous Milotic. It's an awesome Pokemon and my favorite water type of Cynthia's. With these upgrades to our team, now we had some crazy strong Pokemon. We only needed two more to fill out the Cynthia decks. But for now, after sailing across Route 9, we reach Spikemouth. The entrance is blocked, although I feel like Garchomp could absolutely tear through some flimsy steel, but whatever. Are you sure about that? Instead, I take the side entrance where Marnie ambushes me for a battle. Just like Team Yell, she uses dark types and we all know who loves dealing with those. Togekiss quickly gives her first two Pokemon the kiss of death before switching into Gabite against Morpeko. An earthquake buries the little rat, with Gabite also taking care of Scrafty a short time later. Quick and clean. This gives us access to Spikemouth, a dark, poorly lit city that really fits Cynthia's whole black on black vibe. Why did I have to get placed into this dump of a city? This place is kind of wild though. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, partner? Aim for the bushes? At the end of an army of Team Yell grunts, Piers is putting on an absolute banger of a concert. Now, Dark types haven't given Cynthia much of a challenge in this run, and this fight is no exception. Togekiss eats Dark types for breakfast, crushing Scrafty with a dazzling gleam, as well as the Malamar that follows. Obstagoon lasts a little longer, but the end result is the exact same. Last up is a Stinky Skunk. I paralyze it with Thunder Wave before Togekiss is badly poisoned by Toxic. Not wanting to deal with that, I switch into Gabite, who handles the situation with two Earthquakes. We dominated Piers, swiped the seventh badge, and threw him in the trash. Aw, I love a family reunion. The game really speeds up from here as we can head straight back to Hammerlock and take on the final gym. I can't wait, Raihan's match is coming up. Oh kid, I can't wait to crush your hero before your very eyes. But before that, our Gabite reached level 48 and finally evolved into a Garchomp. Cynthia's ace and one of my favorite Pokemon. Raihan's team is tough and this is a double battle, but Cynthia has some powerful combinations to counter with. Raihan leads with Flygon and Gigalith, so I go with Glaceon and Milotic, who takes a huge Thunder Punch from Flygon before a Scald onto Gigalith does about half. Glaceon finally gets a chance to be useful with a single four times effective Ice Beam finishing Flygon. On the following turn, we do pretty much the same thing with Scald finishing Gigalith this time and Santa Conda going down to a single Ice Beam. Raihan was already down to just one Pokemon, Gigantamax Duraludon. It's strong, but now we've got a two-on-one advantage. Glaceon barely survives a max rockfall before both Pokemon chip away at Duraludon. After Glaceon finally falls on the following turn, Milotic brings Duraludon into the red. This clears a path for Lucario to come in and with one Aura Sphere, finish the fight, giving Cynthia her eighth and final badge. After the battle, Sonya gets promoted to the rank of Scientist. Wait, really? The person who thought that the Sword and Shield were just sleeping is one of the brightest minds in Galar? 
We're doomed. Before moving on to the end game, now that we've got eight badges, we can go and find Cynthia's final Pokemon for this challenge. After accessing the Crown Tundra, by running all the way to this gravestone, we activate a quest. Once it's completed, by returning to the gravestone, we can find a Spiritomb. Once Togekiss gets it weak and paralyzed, before long, we were able to catch our Spiritomb. With that, we'd caught all of Cynthia's obtainable team members in Pokemon Shield, completing our Cynthia decks. But you might be thinking, Keegan, that Spiritomb is a level 72. It's above the level cap. You're right, but being the big-brained gamer that I am, I did plan for this. And the secret ingredient is love. Remember when I said that my Shellos needed to be male? Well, this is why. Because my female Spiritomb and Shellos are in the same egg group. So we can drop them off at the daycare and wait while the beauty of nature takes its course. While that's going on, I just want to talk about how weird it is for a rock with spirits trapped inside of it to be capable of breeding. Like, does the child have the same souls trapped inside it or entirely new souls? How is this a thing? My mind is melting. Anyway, after pondering that disgusting realization for a while, I went back to the daycare and against all laws of nature, our slug and rock had created life. Nature really is beautiful. With the egg in my party, I ran all across the wild area until it finally hatched into a baby spiritomb. Still weird. After leveling up our beautiful abomination, it was time to begin the end game. Could Cynthia conquer the toughest battles in Galar? and the champion, let's find out. We quickly moved through Route 10, slapping Cabby Jeffrey across the face with Milotic's tail. Never forgive, never forget. Afterwards, we reached Winden for the final tournament to crown a new champion of Gala. But first, we have to go through our closest rivals. Marnie's up first, which means it's Togekiss's time to shine, immediately taking out Lipard with a dazzling gleam and Toxicroak with a four times effective psychic. Against Morpeko, I switch into Garchomp and lay down the law with an earthquake. Scrafty follows soon after, meaning Marnie was already down to her last Pokemon, a Dynamax Grimmsnarl. I use Dig to stall two turns of Dynamax before Garchomp finally goes down to a max Starfall. But we've still got four Pokemon left, so I go with Roserade and one more Sludge Bomb gives us the win. Smell you later, Marnie. That brings us to a final showdown against Hop. And I'm totally over the fact that I lost to him last time. It's not affecting me at all. Hop leads with Double, which actually has no moves that can hit Spiritomb. So it's completely free for me to land a Will-O-Wisp to burn Double, before stalling out the burn damage. Now, this took a really long time, but eventually, we stalled it out. Next up is Hop Snorlax, who I also burn, before switching into Lucario. Hop has a rare big brain moment, predicting my switch and using high horsepower, which is super effective. Lucario survives a hammer arm on the following turn, purely due to the damage reduction from Snorlax's burn. This lets me land a second Aura Sphere, getting the KO on the Sleepy Giant. Pincurchin was able to electrocute Lucario, but Spiritomb got some revenge with Shadow Ball. This brings out Corviknight, who we also burn before Spiritomb hits itself to death. Nice one. From here, Milotic can clean up Corviknight with two Scalds, leaving Hop with only his giant bunny. Since Milotic is so bulky, we can tank two max moves before drowning that rabbit with a second Scald. Revenge never tasted so sweet. Cynthia, that was incredible. Oh, you just wait until I get my hands on you. Cynthia, how does it feel to have defeated your rival? Oh, it was easy. Hop's never given me any trouble. Nope, not even once. In our quest to find Leon who's gone missing, we have to go through Macro Cosmos and their Steel types. These battles can basically be summarized as... Lucario goes brrrr. This woman says that the building we're in is as tall as 100 Machoke standing on top of each other. Wait, since when did Machoke become a unit of measurement? At the top of Rose Tower, we've got to take on Oleana, who has some certified crazy energy about her. But there's only one alpha female here, and that's Cynthia. Lucario skillfully dodges a Will-O-Wisp, demonstrating my Sinnoh champ difference in action, before taking Frostlass down with a Flash Cannon. From here, the fight did not get easier for Oleana. By this point, our team is really diverse. We can go through this fight by simply pivoting around to give us some good type matchups. Her Garbodor did take out my Togekiss, but that's the only KO Oleana gets, as Garchomp can knock out her big pile of trash with a dig. We find Leon, who says we can order whatever we want for dinner. Oh really? Anything, you say? Leon, Leon, the greatest champion ever. Kid, you're about to become Garchomp's next meal if you don't shut up. Now it's time for the Champions Cup, where Cynthia has to rematch against Galar's strongest gym leaders to earn a shot at Leon's crown. But first, Bede returns, looking like he was viciously attacked by a cotton candy machine. 
He demands a rematch, and Cynthia isn't one to back down from a challenge, so we take him on. Bead leads with a Morwile, and I go with Milotic, who picks up an instant KO thanks to a lucky Scald crit. I keep scalding Gardevoir and do land a burn. However, Gardevoir's synchronize ability means I get burned too. Milotic does get weakened, but eventually takes Gardevoir down. But Milotic just keeps clutching up, also burning Rapidash before finally falling. I send Spiritomb out next, and since Rapidash is already low, it takes just one priority Sucker Punch to turn Rapidash into glue. Now Bead was down to just Hatterene, and I was planning to get a little... cheesy. Spiritomb knows Substitute, which can be used to easily stall out Dynamax turns. However, Hatterene's G-Max Smite left me confused, and on the next turn, Spiritomb once again hit itself, and fell to one more attack. Once again, nice job. I went with Roserade next, who does decent damage with Sludge Bomb, but falls to just a single Max Flare. It was now down to a one-on-one, -on -one, but Cynthia still had her trusty Lucario. With the Dynamax now over, one Flash Cannon is all it takes to finish Hatterene and embarrass Bead one more time. Hey Bead, maybe you just lack talent, idiot. Our next two battles are rematches with the gym leaders Nessa and Alistair. But honestly, by this point, they are no match for Cynthia and her insanely powerful roster. We lost a few Pokemon in these battles, but we're never in any real danger of losing, so let's move on. The final gym leader rematch is against Raihan, and this is where things get interesting. I mean, he's supposed to be the Dragon Master, but there's only one top dragon around here, and that's Cynthia's Garchomp. So this one's personal. He leads with Torkoal, but I'm prepared for this and go with my Squishy Slug. And it takes just one super effective Earth Power to bury that turtle. Next is Flygon, who sets up a Sandstorm before Gastrodon hits a Scald, luckily getting the burn. I would have taken Flygon out, but Raihan had to go and cheese with a full restore. I did manage to get Flygon low again, but Gastrodon went down. I have Roserade clean up Flygon before switching into Garchomp to take on Turtonator. From here, I unleashed my demonic hammerhead on Raihan's team with an Earthquake destroying Turtonator, and Dragon Claw ripping Gudra to pieces instantly. With Raihan down to only one Duraludon, I use my trusty dig strategy to stall for two turns. After Garchomp just survives a hit, I charge up one last Earthquake and just fall short. It's so low that a gentle breeze would probably kill Duraludon. As a result, Garchomp does fall, but as a sign of disrespect, I defeat Raihan's final Pokemon with my pretty little flower. There's always someone younger coming up. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm older than you. Pop and his furry give us a small pep talk, and he renews his tier 3 sub like a good simp. Now we've earned our shot at the champion Leon, but Rose interrupts. If you want to be a Sigma grindset male like me, join my course for only $2.99 per month. Oh please, no one's gonna fall for that. I can't wait to be a Sigma male. Hang on, if Hop signs up for that scam, he won't be able to donate his salary to me. I have to do something about this. Soon after, we confronted Rose to punish him for the crime of threatening Cynthia's income. He's got a team of strong steel types, but we have a Lucario. Lucario absolutely goes in with Aurasphere destroying his Escavalier, Ferrothorn, Clinclang, and Berserker. It was a bloodbath. Last is his big elephant, Copperaja. It finally does take down my Lucario, but now Cynthia's Garchomp takes over. With two earthquakes, we finish the hit on Rose, stopping his pyramid scheme once and for all. But we're not done yet. Now we have to take down the all-powerful, legendary dragon, Eternatus. Cynthia's no stranger to dealing with legendary dragons though, like that time in the manga where Cynthia's Garchomp buried Giratina under Draco Meteors. Cynthia's so cool. Anyway, Eternatus is powerful, but it's no match for the almighty, demonic Togekiss, who slays Eternatus with a few super effective psychics. Then we have to beat Eternatus in a max raid, and what do you know, those dogs actually are alive. We all team up and slay Eternatus' giant hand, saving the day once and for all. Finally, it was time. The iconic showdown between the two toughest trainers, Cynthia and Leon. I decided to bring Cynthia's platinum team and kept my Pokemon underleveled just to make it that much more difficult. Now, there was only one thing left to do. Beat Leon. He leads with Aegislash, and I stay true to Cynthia's team by going with Spiritomb. Leon protects with King Shield on turn one, but on the next turn, a Sucker Punch from Spiritomb does about a third damage. We tank a Shadow Ball, and since Aegislash is now in its blade form, one more Sucker Punch is enough to get the KO, giving us the early lead. Next is Haxorus, and I expect either a Dragon or Ground-type move, so go into my Togekiss who is immune to both. This gives me a free switch. Togekiss barely survives an Iron Tail, which allows it to land a second Dazzling Gleam, 
team on the next turn for another KO. Leon goes into Rhyperial, and I took a huge risk here, hoping it would go for a rock move, but instead it used Heat Crash, which instantly decimated my Lucario that I tried switching into. So I send out Roserade, who can quickly get some revenge with a four times effective energy ball, sucking the life out of Rhyperia. Leon's Dragapult can be deadly, so I can't take any chances. I switch into my Togekiss, effectively sacrificing it so that I can safely bring Spiritomb back out. Unfortunately, a Sucker Punch only does about half of Dragapult's health, before Spiritomb was sent to the Shadow Realm. It was all down to a 3 on 3, but Leon still had his Dynamax. This was going to go right down to the wire. I need to get rid of Dragapult, so took a risk by sending out Roserade. Luckily, I survive a Flamethrower, and a super effective Shadow Ball gives Dragapult a dose of Flower Power, taking it down. Next up is Rillaboom, but since I'm faster, Cynthia's Roserade can land a Sludge Bomb for huge damage. It's not enough to get the KO though, and Rillaboom finishes Roserade with a high horsepower. But now it's time for my ace, Garchomp. With Rillaboom low, one Dragon Claw is all that it takes to finish the job. But now Leon was down to his ace, Gigantamax Charizard. This is not a fair matchup, but I've given Garchomp the move Stone Edge for this very occasion. This does enormous damage to Charizard, however, isn't enough to take it down. And on the next turn, Charizard finishes Garchomp. Cynthia had only one Pokemon left, Milotic. We do have a good type matchup, but this Charizard knows a grass type move. It all comes down to this. Charizard charges up a huge, super effective max overgrowth and... Milotic just survives on only 11 HP. With one last Scald, Charizard's flame is drowned out, giving us an incredibly clutch win. With that, Cynthia had conquered the Galar region, proving once and for all who the strongest champion really is. Jump into this video next for more Pokemon content. Remember to like the video and let me know in the comments which of Cynthia's Pokemon is your favorite. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.